Okay, so good morning. Uh, another exciting talk about this time Manet and the Paris transformed. What we really want to look at is the influence that uh, that transformation of Paris had not only on the population in Paris and in the whole of France, because Paris became such an attraction um, much more than before, but also changed the life of artists. And so we're going to see in which way they did. In, 19, in 1848, there was uh, one of the many revolutions that happened in France uh, in the 19th century, and that one toppled the last king of France, uh, Louis Philippe, uh, who was ousted and then replaced by the uh, uh, Republic, which was by that time the Second Republic. Uh, the person that became the president of the Republic was the, actually the nephew of, Na, of the Emperor Napoleon. Uh, the Napoleon, Louis Napoleon, as he was named at the time, had spent quite a bit of time in um, London in exile because uh, he had been very active politically and they wanted uh, him out. And so he spent some time in London. In London, if you remember, at the end of the 17th century, in the 1666, if I remember well, went through a terrible fire. And so because of the fire, London was rebuilt and rebuilt with a plan, with urban planning. And Napoleon was really struck by that. He loved it, the wide avenues, the parks, uh, kind of an order and a facility for the traffic, even though the car didn't exist yet, but you had lots of carriages and there were lots of accidents because people were not respecting uh, the traffic laws. And so when in uh, 1852, Napoleon that had been president of the Republic uh, decided that he wanted to go on being in power. He was not allowed normally to renew uh, his uh, state as a president. He did the coup and was uh, with others uh, successful and became emperor. And so he became emperor Napoleon III, not the second because the little son of Napoleon had worn that title until he died very young. What we see here is actually Napoleon III, who is um, in front of Napoleon. And I hope my, let me show, yeah. So here is Napoleon III. He was rather short, about 5'5". Five, five. And he is across from the Baron Haussmann, who had, he had named prefect of uh, the city of Paris, and very quickly put him in charge of an enormous program that transformed Paris in a modern, modern city. Uh, in this time, what he shows is that scene shows is the annexation um, of 11 communes around Paris to the city. So, what uh, Paris, what made is for those of you that have been to Paris, it's called arrondissement, district made of it. And so instead of having 11 um, or, or 12 uh, districts, he added eight to it. So a whole series, and we'll see the map in a minute, that made Paris much, much larger. The population had grown exponentially in Paris uh, by the time he became emperor and they needed that space to accommodate the people properly. And especially once they decide to destroy the old medieval center of Paris, they had to push all that population to the outside of Paris, to the, the surroundings, uh, because most of the people that were there were rather poor. And unfortunately for them, their displacement, they displaced about 200,000 people. So that's why they needed the space for that. And this is uh, what happened. Now, what is interesting when you see that uh, portrait that actually people that were around Napoleon didn't like because they be were barely visible. 
the same painter, Adolf uh, Yvon, had to redo the painting. Unfortunately, the new painting uh, was destroyed in a fire. But what we have to realize, see how you can be politically correct. Napoleon was 5'5", five five. he was 6'3". There is no way that we can see that in the painting. So he was very politically correct towards Napoleon. <laughs> So this is the old Paris at the time, a map of 1740. We have the same river with the, the uh, Ile de la Cité here, the Lille Saint Louis over there, uh, and the, the borders the way they were. By the time uh, Napoleon is there, Paris had changed quite a bit. For a while, Paris had been uh, neglected because don't forget, that Louis XIV, for example, had moved the whole court to Versailles. And so because the king wasn't there and all the rich people weren't there, you had that kind of let go in, in Paris. But uh, before it had happened too. So by the time uh, Henry IV was assassinated in 1610, he had already rebuilt the Pont Neuf, which was the first bridge with sidewalks. Uh, and that was not lined with buildings. We, if you look at now in you go to Florence or you go to Venice and you still have these bridges with with boutiques on it that was the case of most of the bridges so for the first time the Pont Neuf is a bridge without buildings on uh, it was uh, he linked also the Louvre to the Tuileries Palace uh, and created the first Paris residential square that was the Place Royale which is now the Place des Vosges in the Quartier of the Marais, the, the most beautiful um, location in, in, old, in the, the center of Paris. In the 17th century, Richelieu, who was the chief minister of Louis XIII, uh, wanted to make Paris the most beautiful city in uh, Europe. So he built five new bridges, uh, a new chapel for the Sorbonne, the, the, the university, and he built, of course, a palace for himself, which became the Palais Royal after his death. Louis XIV distrusted the Parisian and especially the fact that people were kind of independent from him if they were living in Paris. And so, as I mentioned, he moved the court to Versailles in 1682. Uh, but that didn't prevent Paris to flourish for many things. For example, the theater, like the Comédie Française, also a series of academies that were founded by um, Louis XIV, the Academy of Painting, the Academy of Science, and so on. And then to show that the city was safe, he had all the walls that were surrounding Paris demolished and replaced by boulevards. And these large boulevards that made the small belt of Paris I still go back to Louis XIV. In fact, the term, the term boulevard comes from the Dutch, which is interesting, bulwerk, which were the pass on top of the, the, the fortification. You had that uh, little pass for the soldiers to go around. And that was called bulwerk. And so when they demolished it, the boulevard, the word comes from bulwerk, uh, replaces actually exactly the path of the fortif of fortification. And that thing happened in actually uh, many cities around uh, Europe. The, he also built the Place Vendôme, the Place des Victoires, and began the Invalides. So what year did that happen? Yes. What year did that happen? That's uh, under Louis XIV. So he died in 1715. So that was prior Fairly to that. Early. Yeah around 1700. So here is the map of Paris, which is pretty much what it is now. And uh, I'm going to put on the upper corner a map that's going to give you an idea of the arrondissement. So you have, you see, uh, 1 to 12 that make all that center plus this that was the old Paris. And then they, they attach to Paris all the things that are around. Uh, all the way from 13 to 20. And so that doubled, literally, more than doubled the surface of Paris. Napoleon had taken a large map of Paris, put it on the wall of his office, 
And together with Hausmann, they delineated what they want, which means uh, literally in urban planning, uh, do uh, enhance the traffic in Paris because it was uh, once everybody had come back to, to the city after the death of uh, Louis XIV, uh, as I mentioned, the, the population had doubled since 1815. And um, so what they're going to do, and we'll see at, at the end of this, they're going to try to make that kind of a cross path in the center there that's going to help circulation on uh, north, south, and uh, east, uh, west uh, for the carriages. Also, the, the railroad had started uh, flourishing in France, and uh, they wanted the boulevard to lead to the, each of the station to ease up again the, the, the way for people to reach uh, these places. Also, we have to realize is that there was no sewer system in Paris. So that's what made the city really difficult. So let's look at uh, the Baron Haussmann here, you see, born in 1809, died in 1891. Did during, so as soon as he became um, the prefect of the first of Paris and then of the Seine department, in 1853, all the way to 70, when because of jealousies and maybe also because of some of his excesses, uh, he was uh, literally, I mean, let go, let's say, uh, because people thought he had um, gone beyond his authority. We have to realize that the work was done rather fast. By 1870, most of what he wanted to do, except for the Opéra Garnier, uh, was done, was accomplished. And that's huge. And could only be done in a sense because it was an authoritarian regime. So you didn't have to go through the Congress to pass, you know, can we have that money? No, we'll spend that much and we'll find it, you know, wherever it is. Um, so the things were really moved, if you want, but of course, to a high price too is the 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 taxes that were levied, and the, and the cost of life too because they not, didn't always have the security system to to keep the uh, workers to uh, to work safely. So anyway, <laughs> very uh, for quite a long time. Uh, the Baron Osman had been vilified for what he did. I remember my own father hated him dearly because he had demolished the old charming medieval center of Paris. Okay, charming if you think of it the romantic way, but remember the streets were little meanders, there were no sewer system. So whenever you had to dispose of something on the upper floors, you would just throw it through the window. So the, the streets were not a good place to go along. They were dirty. Um, it was unsafe because there was no light. So to look at the positive way of the Baron Hausmann, not only he was a genius as far as urban planning, recall the right people around him to do the work and to plan, but he also uh, brought water supply to the city, sewer, uh, complete sewer system, there were gas lights on all the streets uh, and quite an amazing number, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, kiosk for uh, the, the regular human needs. Uh, so these were uh, little kiosks at, along the park so people could go and you didn't have people in the bushes defecating or, or uh, making water. He installed parks, the large parks of the Bois de Boulogne and the Parc de Vincennes, uh, but also a series of parks within the city. Uh, he started the, the project of the opera that was finished in uh, 1900. So before, you know, after he died and long after Napoleon was gone. And also the Al, the Al is the market, the, the, the biggest market place in Paris that kind of exists if you want, again, if you want to know where it is, it's where the Centre Pompidou is in Paris. 
used to be the Al covered Al where people would come from the countryside and sell produces and others. This is the way Paris used to look. And so when you see very uh, narrow cobbled street, tall, tall building that opened directly on the street, you had no sidewalk. Um, the river, that, that little river that was going through Paris and uh, flowing into the Seine River were used by the tanners to do their products. So imagine all the chemical products that were exposed off in that little river and that would end up in the Seine River, making it a terrible pollution. Uh, So just to give you an example, this is the, the church saint germain l'Auxerrois, which was considered the royal church. It was the church closest to the Louvre. Uh, and during the revolution was used to store things. But you can see how originally it was just surrounded very closely by houses. So you couldn't barely see it. So by 1850s, they demolish and they're in the process of demolishing this. And this is the way it looked by 1867. They had planted trees in front of it and you had a lo lovely place for people to gather. And now the church looked really good. And the, 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 all the buildings that are built around are according to the plan of Hausmann's where you had to have a certain standard of facade so that there would be a unified architecture in Paris. The severity of the demolition um, was not unusual around Paris. This would be the kind of thing they had to go through. But remember again, there are no tractors and everything. Everything was done with carriages and, and uh, mules that were pulling these carriages. So imagine everything is at another scale when you remember uh, the way things were done. The photographer, by the way, Charles Marville, was hired by the city of Paris to document the changes resulting from the demolition. It's even um, shown in painting by Johann uh, Jonkind, uh, Johann Jonkind, who had a quite a big influence on the young Monet. He was a Dutch painter, but lived in Paris, uh, had, was very famous in Paris. And there he is again documenting that moment of transition between the old city and the new one. And again, you can see the mules that are just uh, towing the, the carriages with old Imagine the number of bricks and stones and all kind of refuse that came out of these demolitions. So the positive thing is, as you know, that the fact uh, Paris became known as the city of light, uh, both because it was a very leading role during the age of the enlightenment in the 18th century, but more literally because uh, Paris was one of the first European cities to adopt gas street lightings. Uh, in the 1860s, the boulevard and streets of Paris were illuminated by 56,000 gas lamps. Now is also did, and I love the name of the place at the time, it was called the Chalet de Nécessité, mm -hmm. or public toilet <laughs> in a more <laughs> uh, down, down way. Uh, but the Chalet, de so it's literally the uh, cabin of necessity. I, I love the, the, the term, it's very French. And so you would find that uh, in very judicious location where people would need it. And they were actually good looking, which is quite interesting. Just to give you an idea, and this is quite interesting, the Rue de Rivoli that you know, that is, goes all along from the Place de la Concorde to the Louvre uh, with that very um, repeated rhythmic facade with the arcades along the, the street uh, was, had started being built. Uh, before Napoleon the first. Napoleon went on doing it. And then uh, the king 
Charles X went on, and as well as Louis Philippe. And finally, uh, the Emperor Napoleon extended it all the way to the Marais, so all the way to where it is now. So look at the kind of, of uh, public work here with electrical lights. Can you believe that they have these lights showing up uh, the, the work? And this is a view of the after it was built of the Rue de Rivoli with no cars, but all carriages. By the time it was done, Paris had a, a network of new boulevards and new streets. So you can see there in red, what was built under Napoleon and Haussmann, and then in blue, uh, what was done uh, afterwards by the, the Third Republic. So it's an enormous network of things, and all that done in a little over 20 years. It's, it's amazing to think about it. And I just wanted to notice, because we were going to talk about the, the two great parks, which are really the lungs of Paris, if you want, is the very large Bois de Boulogne that was entirely renovated with uh, detouring the rivers, having cascades, relief done. Uh, this is, by the way, if you ever watch tennis, this is where the uh, Roland Garros is located. Uh, and But you have the Bois de Boulogne, you can get lost into it. And it became a place where people wanted to, to meet or wanted to be seen. You would go to the Bois de Boulogne, have a picnic, and you would have elegant gentlemen going by in, on horseback or in the, the carriages and say, oh, did you see the count such and such? He just went by. And then, then you had the very elegant ladies walking and strolling around the, the place. This was the atmosphere that really that new Paris brought. And in the street, also the fact that all the large boulevards were lined with trees made it a much more amicable uh, place to be. And so people came down on the street and you become, you start having that um, culture of what we call the flaneur, the flaneur, the person who is strolling. And the flaneur, he's going to dress well. Normally he's a gentleman. He's going to go and walk slowly so he can be seen properly. And he's also going to meet and, you know, the top hat and it's going to be hello to one and to the other. And that becomes really that culture of being seen. And then you have the terraces that are going to open with the cafes and give even more of that thing where people sit and look at people that go by. Let me just, there's somebody making something. Right. Okay. So, sorry. Um, so here is the timeline. And now, of course, in the very middle is Edouard Manet. Uh, that's going to live from 32 to 83. But I put different names there because these are people that have some influence on him, De La Croix, Courbet, for sure, Courbet, who is almost contemporary with him and who's going to be a very good friend of his. Honoré Daumier, who is also one of the pioneers of the um, realist movement. And then the biggest friend of Edouard Manet is Claude Monet. They're going to have a very close friendship. Uh, Beth Morisot, who is going to become his uh, sister-in-law, she's going to marry his younger brother, Eugène, and she's a painter herself. Uh, Renoir, who is, of course, uh, and the Gap, both the, the big names of the Impressionist. We have to realize, well, that Monet was never an Impressionist. He was, at times, influenced by them, knew them very much, supported them very much, but never wanted to be associated as a painter to their movement. So Edouard Manet, let me see how I can get rid of this thing. Here, there we are. There we are. Uh, born in Paris in 1832 from a 
very well-to-do bourgeois family. Um, his father is a judge and would love to see his son go into law, uh, but uh, he has an uncle who is a or loves art. Detour. Jean, uh, be careful because you are making some noise on the. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, so through his uncle, he's going to enroll uh, in a special course of drawing. He tries to get into the um, Navy, but uh, fails twice to the exam to join the Navy. And so he is going to uh, manage to go there as what is called a pilotin. So it's not a pilot, but it's kind of an ass assisting pilot. And so he will be on a ship for a couple of years and uh, sail on the training vessel to Rio de Janeiro. And uh, unfortunately for him, while he's over there, he's going to catch syphilis, uh, the big disease for the, for the uh, sail, sailors, unfortunately. And that's going to cause his death ultimately. Uh, between 1850 and 56, he will study at the academy under Thomas Couture, but he rebels against his teacher. He liked the man, but he didn't like the way he was painting. And, but during the time he's there, he takes really advantage in copying the old master in the Louvre. Uh, between 54 and 56, he will visit Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands with his family. Uh, loved Italy, discovers all the, uh, the great masters over there. Uh, and he will go back to, to Italy one more time. In 63, he had already known Suzanne uh, Lenhoff, who was his uh, piano teacher, and for his brother too, and uh, had become his uh, uh, mistress. He actually had a son with her and we'll talk about him uh, later. Uh, and then when his father dies, because the family would have resented it, he marries her in 1863. She was a very talented musician and that's what he keeps telling his friends. She's very nice, she's pretty, she's a little plump. She's Dutch originally from south of, uh, a city south of Amsterdam uh, and uh, will, lead a, a pretty decent life with him uh, and their son for uh, the rest of his life. In 1863, we'll have the, the episode of the Salon des Fusées, and we'll talk about that at length. In, despite the fact that he's very influenced by Spanish art, it's only in 65 that he travels to Spain. Uh, in 68, he becomes friend with the Impressionist, which, as you know, is not officially a movement yet, um, through Bert Morisot, who, as you know, is going to marry his brother. Uh, he does plein air paintings, and it's going to influence his color scheme where he tends to go lighter. Uh, unfortunately, towards the end of his life, he gets really sick, he's extremely tired. Uh, we'll see that he's got to change. He has to be seated most of the time. He's um, going to suffer from consequences of his syphilis uh, disease. Um, will suffer from, it's called ataxia, uh, locomotive uh, ataxia, which means his, he can barely walk by that time. He has a lot of pain in uh, his uh, lower limbs. Uh, in 1883, he will have to have uh, his left foot amputated and will die 11 days later. Uh, his extant work, 430 oil paintings, 89 pastels, mostly at the end of his life because it's less tiring to do, and more than 400 works on paper. He was quite a lithographer. He left also one student, uh, one uh, a girl uh, that we will see, and her name escapes from me now, uh, but um, we'll, we'll see a portrait of her. She's going to become one of the female impressionists, lesser known because she died very young. I'm sorry, did they, were they also infected with syphilis, his wife and his other woman? 
That's a very good point. Not that I know of. Um, normally, yes. So I don't know if they were already uh, using preservative or what. I don't know. It was because I think, that, you know, as the the French leather, as the British mentioned, uh, was in use. So maybe he did. So I'm not, he was, we don't know much about his intimate life. He was very private. And so even the birth of his son, the son was um, inscribed in the, you know, on, on the um, papers of the commune, uh, showing her as being his godmother and him being his godfather, uh, that she declared him as his little brother her little brother. And so it's only after she died that her son called her mother. Otherwise, she would call her by her first name. His son was conceived without a preservative. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah, I know. But but she survived him. So she, they, we, there's no talk about her being sick. No, it's a good, very good point. So while he was in um, in Italy, he copied many of the works and he was absolutely fascinated by the work of Titian, the Venus of Urbino, that he copied, oh, sorry, there is, I did a mistake there and I hope, yeah, it's, yeah, believe me and we'll see his, uh, yeah, so sorry for that, that's my, my works. I think maybe this way, yeah, okay, this is a copy that he did of the Venus of Urbino. And sorry, I, I mixed up my, my animations. Uh, he did the same with um, the works of uh, Delacroix. Uh, Delacroix was at that time, that work was uh, exhibited at the Louvre and had been shown also at the Exposition Universelle in, in the, the World Fair in Paris. And he was, he loved that work. He thought many people, it, it's interesting because it definitely is not my feeling about Delacroix, thought that Delacroix was cold. And Delacroix has an incredible color palette. And so uh, I don't feel the case, but what he said is that Delacroix as a person was cold, but his paintings were not. They thought that was a great painting. So he copied it too. Now, in 1853, Napoleon married Eugenie du Derger de Montijo at age 23. She uh, was the 16 Countess of Teba and the 15 Marquise of Ardalis, but she was very pretty. And Napoleon sincerely fell in love with her. On her maternal grandfather's side, she was a Scottish, uh, she had some Scottish blood too, uh, William Kirkpatrick of Closeburn who was, he was a Scottish wine merchant. She received a lot of her education in Paris. And as I mentioned, uh, she was, Napoleon was quite attracted by her, but she uh, pushed him away to wait until marriage. And so uh, married in 53 and by 1856, she gave birth to a son and heir apparent, Napoleon, Prince Imperial that you see down there who never succeeded his father, though he got the title of Napoleon the uh, Fourth, but died uh, in a, he he went to a fight uh, in South Af in South Africa and was killed at age twenty three. But the fact that Virginie Montijo was Spanish brought uh, an incredible. Um, air of, uh, how can you say, es Espanolization, if you want, in, uh, in uh, France. And so everything that looked Spanish was good. So we call that in French, Espanolisme. And um, Manet was quite an adept to, to that new wave. And so uh, because of Eugenie, there were some ballets that, were, that came into the, the city and he loved it. He loved the sound of it. He loved the costume, the exoticism, everything. And so uh, he is going to uh, 
make multiple paintings that have that flavor or, or are influenced by Velázquez or Goya. Uh, typical of, uh, of him already then is that loose brushstroke, the simplification of details and very important is that suppression of uh, transitional tones. He doesn't have that whole series of glazes that were used by painters at the time. Uh, and it doesn't have that uh, modeling of the figures the same way. It just goes by the dark and the light. Here are two other paintings uh, that are Espanolist, uh, Lola of Valence, uh, who was a, a Spanish dancer and had, of course, this beautiful costume, very high in color, and the, and the great veils and the great stands also. And by that time, he decides he wants to do one more painting. And the one on the right is, in fact, uh, the Victorine Meurant, who was his model at the time that he disguises as a bullfighter. And she was very petite. So when you look at her, she's, uh, she has that costume that probably belonged to a child, but not uh, even to a bullfighter. The, he's very much influenced by uh, Velázquez, and this is a painting he did uh, called The Philosopher, also known as Beggar with Oysters, that is quite directly influenced by the series of philosophers that uh, Velázquez had painted uh, in the mid-17th century. Uh, he likes the, the background that Velázquez is using, kind of a very neutral background, uh, that uh, strong chiaroscuro uh, and the way he handles the black on black. This is also very much influenced by Velasquez, the uh, five player. And we don't think that it is his son, by the way, because he's used his son quite often. He loved, he adored his son that uh, lived with him, uh, but... Um, I think he was too young at that time to, to be shown this way. He would have been three, so he's an uh, older kid. Also, later on, he goes on looking at uh, Spanish painters with the famous uh, execution of the Emperor Maximilian of, Mex of uh, Mexico. You see here, uh, his interpretation of it that is very much influenced by the Goya painting of the 3rd of uh, May 1808, though he makes a, a variance of it. As you can see, uh, in this painting, he had actually two versions of the paintings. On the first one, uh, they had hats uh, that were uh, Mex the Mexican army. But then in the second version, he decided to dress them as French military, which was not the case. He was fired, but, uh, he was killed by um, Mexican uh, people, not by the French. But he considered that the French were guilty of his death. And so he, he manipulates the thing in such a way that he dresses them that way, even to the point of putting the features of Napoleon III as the, ser the sergeant that, uh, that the, um, at the head of the squadron. He also turns Maximilian as a martyr. He considers that the French have abandoned him and uh, Maximilian that was resigned to, to die when it happened is shown even with stigmatas on his hands, with the, 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 the blood when it hasn't been fired yet, so he could not have the blood. He's shown as Christ, if you want. His dream was to one day manage to paint a Christ uh, in cross, on the cross. And here is actually a photograph of the execution of uh, Maximilian. So you can see that it's not the, the same setting at all, but it, it, the whole important thing was the idea. And this is very much what is going to lead 
uh, Manet all his life. It's, it's what he feels, what is in him that he wants to portray on the canvas. So Manet is going to go through moments of glory and moments of scandals. He wasn't shying away from scandal, though he was a very gentle person and pe he was very charismatic. He was soft-spoken. Uh, people really liked him. By the time he died, he had an enormous amount of friends that liked him very much. And in this painting, early paintings of the music in the Tuileries garden, this is prior to the building, the Tuileries being demolished. Uh, that's gonna happen uh, actually uh, nine years later. Um, he is showing himself here with the crowd in the gallery. It, it, this is very central location, but it was refreshing in the summer. You had trees, you had shade, uh, you had some fountains and so on. So it was nice to be there. And obviously there were chairs for people to sit on. By then the wooden chairs had been replaced by uh, iron chairs. And there he shows himself and a whole series of people uh, that he knew. So he portrays himself here. But uh, then you have uh, a, another uh, a sculptor, Zachary Astra, that, sorry, he's there. I don't know if I, yeah. Let me see, because I have, yeah, okay, there he is. There is Astra on the bottom. At the back there is uh, Offenbach, and Gucci next to him, sorry. Didn't, his brother is the one with the white trousers. And then you have some other people that he knows. Uh, as I said, the composer uh, Jacques Offenbach. So a very broad uh, group of friends. And this is the kind of painting that uh, relates to what Charles Baudelaire wanted. He wanted painting that represents the moment, the contemporary people, uh, and also a fleeting moment. He wanted something that wasn't paused, but rather alive and having that uh, kind of light. Charles Baudelaire is going to have a very uh, big influence in his life. Uh, he is the one that really pushed everybody at the time to go modern. Um, and modernity is a transient, the fleeting, the contingent. Uh, but he also was a city person. And he said, who among, who among us has not dreamt in moment of ambition of the miracle of a poetic prose, musical without rhythm and rhyme, supple and staccato enough to adapt the lyrical stirring of the soul, the undulations of dreams, and sudden leaps of consciousness. This obsessive idea is above all a child of giant cities of the intersecting of their myriad relation. And um, Baudelaire believed that a lot. Here you have a view of Baudelaire who was quite a dandy. And that's another novelty that started between England and France, between London and Paris is a series of people that were not part of the aristocracy, but were part of an elite um, that dressed very fancy, in a very fanciful way. Uh, Baudelaire, young, admitted taking two hours to get ready, and for a man that was unusual. And so, um, but as you can see, he wrote a lot of poetries. He was an art critic and he's going to be really a leader for a lot of the intelligentsia in Paris. He was pushing the idea of using urban subject matter as the city, the crowd, the individual passerby. And this is all what you can see what the the Impressionists did when they were doing some uh, views of Paris. The artist also depended a lot on the Salon. Uh, the Salon that was originally started under Louis XIV in 1648, uh, but is going to go on and is, goes on all the way to now. The location has changed, but it's, it's named the Salon because it was in the great Salon. Uh, square salon in the Louvre. 
And uh, what you see there uh, is in the Louvre, and you can see that enormous display of painting. Any painter that um, wanted to become famous had to uh, be vetted and accepted in the Salon and be able to exhibit paintings there that would make them famous and then they could expect commission, not only from the government and so on, but from all the bourgeois and the, the aristocracy. And you can see how it was very important too to see how your work was displayed. If it was too high, people couldn't see it. If it was too low, people had to bend in two to see it and it wasn't good enough. The, most of what was accepted at the time was by the academician uh, painters. There was the, all these teachers at the academy that were doing things that were kind of by that time passé. It was beautifully done technically, but uh, in essence were uh, history painting that were going back to a time that people were not thinking about. Don't forget France had gone through the revolution. And so the, the, the spirit of people was very different. However, the number of people that applied to be, uh, to be part of the Salon was a, extraordinary. Look at, this is a, an engraving showing you uh, an idea of how many paintings were there to be hung. Uh, but before that had to be vetted by a jury. And that was the big thing because these juries were not very broad-minded. They were very much uh, chosen for the taste for what was done in the academy. And so we'll see that this is going to have quite an impact. Of course, the subject of the salon and the snobbism for people to go there was often used as caricature. Here is one of the painting that shows four hours at the salon and you have people that are there totally offended by what they have seen. Some are very curious. There were lots of nudes, you know, but nudes under the, the, the cover of being a goddess, a Greek goddess or a Roman goddess. And so you can see how people can be just uh, offended when some people were astonished, some people liked it, some people didn't. But one year, in 1863, uh, a particularly large amount of paintings were refused and uh, not admitted to the Salon. And people, the artists started rebelling. And whereas the taste of Napoleon III was quite um, traditional, he was looking at Winterthur and all typical uh, portrait painters, uh, he was very smart in wanting to be liked by the people. And so he tried to find a solution. And so he decided that uh, he would a little later open a salon for the people that had been refused uh, a little further in the Palais de l'Industrie. And this palace doesn't exist anymore. It was taken down to be replaced. Uh, by the Grand Palais of the World Fair in uh, 1900. But this is in, in another part of that building that took place, the Salon des Refusés. The first painting that had been refused by Manet is the Déjeuner sur l'herbe, the breakfast on the grass, uh, luncheon on the grass, and uh, shows, of course, something that was seemed to be incredible is one nude woman next to two dressed gentlemen. And then in the back, you have that a young woman who is bathing, but that would be, that was okay. Many things wrong. They didn't like the way he painted. They didn't like his disregard for the proper perspective. They definitely didn't like the fact that without the cover of a deity, he shows a young woman in the nude that not only is there next to two dressed gentlemen, but she also looks at you kind of with an ironic gaze on her face. And people thought it was absolutely horrible. They were um, 
comments in the, the press that we had never seen a woman undressed next to people that were dressed. And that wasn't true because there are many Renaissance paintings that shows that because it was an image. It was an allegory. But because it was an allegory, it was accepted to see nude women and dressed gentlemen. Here he decides, he really thumbed his nose at the crowd and says, why not just showing a woman because she's there? Maybe she's taken a bath and she's there drying up before putting her clothes on. <clears throat> so this, um, this was the, the general comment, though on his friend like Zola and so on, accept what he does and do understand much better his point of view. To make this painting, and by the way, uh, the painting, the, the figures that appear is uh, his younger brother who is here and the, oh, sorry. His younger brother and it's a cross. And then here is his brother-in-law, uh, the uh, brother of uh, Susan. And Victorine Meurant is the main character. Uh, Victorine Meurant, who is his muse, his favorite uh, model. Um, interesting person, we'll see. She's an artist herself and just uh, is making some money in being a model for many of these painters. This is the painting that uh, gave him an idea of the composition. And it's very interesting because that same uh, engraving, the left part was used by his um, professor, Thomas Couture, to, as inspiration for one of his paintings. And then for Manet, he uses, uh, looks at that group. But to the right, you see the Titian, the very celebrated pastoral concert uh, that was totally accepted and was hanging at the Louvre. Uh, as you can see, so that, that was totally acceptable because these are metaphorical figures that represent uh, ideas and goddesses. So who cares that they are in the nude because that's the excuse. So he looks at the hypocrisy of the crowds. A couple of years later, though he had painted it at the same times as the luncheon on the grass, he ex exhibits this, this is even more scandalous, is the famous Olympia uh, that depicts that unclosed central figure, quite cool and confident, who looks boldly at the viewer. She's of course uh, inspired, we'll see, by some uh, Italian masters. But here again, she's not a goddess, she's just what, everybody believes is a prostitute, uh, obviously awaiting a visit because the, her servant, black servant, is bringing a bouquet of flowers. That's obviously somebody is wanting to come in and replaces the little dog that we'll see later by a cat who is quite seem to be surprised. He's up with the tail up. He's um, very much, uh, it is kind of frightened by what happens. And, some people put a parallel between the cat and what the, her hand, her left hand hides on a part of her body. Definitely, he's inspired by the Venus of Urbino. There is no doubt. But again, where the Venus of Urbino was painted with the idea of the we an upcoming wedding um, of a, an important family in um, in Venice, uh, in this case, the connotation is completely different and people understood. But this is just part of that series of painting by Velázquez, uh, by Goya with the Maja uh, Desnuda. Uh, here is uh, very much in the line. And with the Maja, it was the same feeling as this, though she doesn't show a prostitute, but shows somebody who most probably was the mistress of uh, Goya. So for people that didn't have a knowledge of art, if you want, they thought it was incredibly uh, shocking. 
And that's going to bring a lot of caricatures. In the press, you have all kind of, <laughs> you have all kind of um, caricatures shown and, and the people being shocked. As it was in the Salon des Refusés, uh, people couldn't use the snobbism to go there if you want. It was more curiosity. And it was known that when people, there were thousands of people that visited the Salon des Refusés, that pregnant women were forbidden to get in because they might have a stillborn child in, at the view of what was shown at that time. And uh, typically there, there are lots of caricatures showing the men putting in their hands in front of the, the eyes of their wives so that she couldn't look at that uh, obscene scene. Who was Victorine Meurant who had such a big role in uh, Manet's life. She started modeling at the age of 16, first in the studio of Thomas Couture, and might have at the time also studied in the uh, women's uh, workshop. She first modeled for Manet in 62, so just before the, the luncheon on the grass. Um, and she was also a musician. She, when she met Manet, she was carrying her guitar. She was very petite, and so she earned the nickname of the, la crevette, the shrimp. Uh, and she also had red hair. Uh, while she was playing guitar, she also played, uh, as well as she played a guitar, she played the violin and gave lessons uh, to youngsters as well and sang in Café Concert. She stayed very, for a very long part of time uh, the model for uh, Manet until she decided to go very seriously into her art uh, studies. And at that time, um, Manet didn't care very much for what she was doing because she was much more conservative in uh, what she was doing. And, but you, she was a lovely painter. You can see her painting there of a self-portrait of her. That's a Palm Sunday. The family and the friends of uh, Manet played quite a role. Uh, here is the La Lecture, and this is the uh, first, the earliest portrait of Suzanne Lenhoff, who became Manet's wife. Um, as I mentioned, she was a piano teacher from uh, 1849 on and became, it was mistress, uh, and finally in, no, and uh, in 52 gave birth to a son whom she passed off, as I mentioned, as a younger brother that was declared under the name of Leon Coelha. Nobody ever knew who Leon Coelha was and it is no way to be found in the, in the administration. He was baptized in 55 and had his mother Suzanne as godmother and his father Edouard as godfather. Uh, and uh, it's only in 63 when Manet's father died, as I mentioned, that he married her. She was very beautiful, very good, and a great musician. So when you look at this painting, it's 65, uh, it's starting to look a little impression, as though the touch is very different. But his, uh, by that time, he had met uh, some uh, people and his palette, maybe because he's a happy man, his palette goes uh, much lighter in color. Here is a later painting of her, more mature. And this is probably a portrait of his son. He made an enormous amount of paintings of his uh, little son in different disguise. He, he is the, the little page with a sword. He was very much loved by both his mother and, and father. And as I mentioned, it's only after she died that he called her mother. But he had great friends, and one of them was uh, Zola, beside Baudelaire, uh, but a great friend of, uh, of Zola, who supported him since 1866. And you can see in this painting, he actually shows an image of the Olympia on the wall, but also some Japanese uh, painting because it was a time of 
Besides Espanolism, it was also Japanism. Uh, as by that time, Japan had opened its borders and people became in contact with Japanese works. Zola had written an enormous amount of, of uh, novels, uh, had also defended Dreyfus. He was the one, Jacques, who wrote that incredible uh, article in the paper that was defending that um, officer of the French army, that a Jewish officer who had been accused of a crime and had been exiled uh, and imprisoned uh, falsely just because he was Jewish. And uh, in one of his painting, later paintings in 77, he uh, names this painting of the young prostitute that you see there, but a high level prostitute, uh, Nana. And this is one of the titles of the books of Zola. But the, the figure of Nana appears earlier in some books at about the same date as 1877, whereas the Nana will only be published in 80. And the way that you see his work evolve is you have these croppings, for example, that figure that just appears at the front. And this is all inspired by Japanese prints. And certainly he leaves that uh, what we had seen before, these rather neutral background, now much more work, much more detailed. Still influenced by both Spanish and Japanese art uh, is the balcony. And this introduced a new figure in his friend. It's Bert Morisot, the painter, uh, famous painter, who comes uh, there. He's been introduced to her by the Fr Belgian uh, painter Stevens. Stevens. And um, she is herself is studying painting. He doesn't, he's kind of patronizing at first. They don't like one another at first. Uh, they will come to like one another, but he's the type, he didn't care for the kind of thing he was doing. So he would come over her shoulder and correct her paintings while she was doing them. And she really disliked that and came to with time. As soon as he would turn his back, she would correct it back to where it was. Um, but a uh, very pretty girl coming from a very good family. Her uh, sister was also pretty and came to, uh, to know the, the whole group of impressionists too. So this is again, something he's looking at Goya, definitely at the Mahas on the balcony. Uh, he's looking at that and using the same kind of technique where he is only focusing on her, as you can see, the two figures at the back are flattened compared to the way he presents her. He will make her pose quite often for him. And uh, he's, she, she mentions the fact that he is impossible. He takes forever to paint. And uh, she really dislikes the way she said she, she would get cramps. She, she would just uh, have a big problem. But as you can see, a lovely uh, young woman who is going to marry his younger brother. And then they're gonna have a great friendship. She, it's an interesting painter because she painted all her life. But by the time she died at the age of 80 or so, uh, on her uh, death certificate was written without profession oh. because it was not so well seen, well regarded for a woman to work as a painter. He had great friends. Manet was definitely one of them. And so here you can see he describes uh, a Monet, sorry, a Monet painting on his studio with his wife. And this was really known. Monet had built, actually inspired by Daubigny, by the, the, um, the older painter, landscape uh, painter. He had loved, in, particularly in the summer, to be on a boat and paint was refreshing. You had the freshness of the, the, the river that was coming up. 
and he would uh, have his wife there sometimes paint her or just the landscape around it. Manet didn't like landscapes. For him, landscape was just a backdrop for a scene, but he never made any landscapes of, as such. And then on the, the right hand side there is his uh, brother-in-law, Lenhoff, uh, with a lady that nobody has been able to identify. Uh, here we can see that he's been in touch with Impressionist. It's 74, that's the year of the big exhibition, uh, first exhibit, uh, Impressionist exhibition. Uh, and he starts having some influence by them in the, the color, in the atmosphere that he uh, plays. He is uh, the Money family in the garden. It's a small painting, but it looks big, but it's a, a small painting. And here is Eva Gonzalez, no, <laughs> I remember, uh, who was the only pupil that he ever took, uh, who married, went on painting, but died of an embolism at age 33. We're going to take five minutes it's, I'm past the half of, of my presentation, but if you want to have, I know some people like to have a little coffee or stretch your legs, five minutes and people online can ask me questions if they want, you can unmute. Anne? Yes. Hi, this is Chicago. Hi. Yes, Chicago. <laughs> I sent you uh, an email about an article that I read last week about uh, the uh, Brotherhood, uh, Rosetta. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know if you got it because- uh, I didn't see it this morning, but- uh... Might have gone into spam because it probably won't recognize my name, but it's- an oh, No, it's not, it doesn't, my, my firewall is not that strict, okay. but- um... There's a, there's a show now at the Delaware Art Museum about Rossetti and the Brotherhood, and I thought you might be interested okay, in Okay, no, I'll be glad to see it. Yeah, it will, my uh, email is artnick1 at aol.com. Yeah, so. I know your email, yeah. Okay, but uh, I'll, I'll see if I get it. Otherwise, I'll let you know. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I know. No problem. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Hello, Coco. <laughs> oh, my girl. You are a service dog, official service dog now. <laughs> I love when they do that. <laughs> you know, just kind of saying, I'm there. It's marvelous how an animal can be. So that my dog is almost almost the same. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he's a good dog. Huh? How long have you had Tucker? Four and a half years. Oh. Yeah. He we believe he was two when I got him, but we're not sure of his age, so. But according to the vet, he thought it was about yeah. that. He see, doesn't seem too old. No, no, no not for sure. Like and he was, too, he had older. tremendous energy when yeah. I got him. Oh. So yeah. he, he must have been around that age. She's a good painter too, by the way. But yeah. it, it's interesting because there is a few of these women. They are the known female uh, impressionist. Mary Cassatt and uh, Beth Morisot are the two most famous, but there are some now that they dig out that are delightful. Yeah, something she, are you going to show us something she did? Or, uh, or not or here. I'm, I'm going to, no, I'm showing uh, later in uh, another, I think it, not in the next one, oh, the one after. Some extra, uh, it's great. Did Manet ever take acknowledge his son? Uh, no, the, the, he kept that name all his life, short life though, 
but yeah. um, but apparently was very spoiled by by his father and mother. A lot of guilt, probably <laughs> that they didn't. Yeah, but you see, in society, it yeah, it it. My name was from a good family, and so Jack Nicholson was raised by. You know, always thought it was his sister. Yeah. But you see the transformation of Paris was drastic. Oh yeah. it's, and we tend to, to overlook that, but it, it's incredible. You can still go to New York City and see these little areas where like, you can see that this was an old section because of the streets are so narrow. Yes, but New York was built as a, you know, later. much, much later. Paris goes back to, yeah. to I mean, it starts in 300 and some. So it developed that way as most old cities in Europe. But, but when you see here, you, you have with, with New York, very quickly you have the grid uh, that is set. But, but you see, for example, because that's what people say, you go to some old cities in, in, uh, in Europe, that I still have this narrow street. You go to Malaga, for example, and you have this narrow street. In, in Italy, you have some, you know, where they, they hang the, the clothing from one window to the other. In Sicily, you can take both sides. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's. It's crazy. And you see vehicles going through sometimes. Don't mention. Like, oh my gosh, you're walking there. But, but, you but the problem was that when you don't have any. Um, sewer system then it becomes a big problem of course yeah yeah they're, they're charming to look at but not but that's not practical <laughs> to live in i know there's a lot of stuff back there yeah okay we're gonna go on it's we we have about 10 more minutes, I think. If somebody could uh, turn off the light, then thank you, Steve. Okay. You can mute everybody this time. And if you could submit um, last week's presentation. I okay, I'll that. do. Thank you I'll so do. much. Okay, so another series of events that Napoleon uh, favored and actually uh, organized, and that was following what had happened in England uh, before, is a series of world fair, and they're going to be numerous. Uh, they start in the 50s, already uh, 55, if I remember well, and then it's almost every five years you have one in, um, in Paris. Uh, by that time, some of the center of Paris is already uh, in places. And the causes, the of course, the awe of uh, people that rediscover Paris. So for these world fair, most of the time, the central location was what is called the Champ de Mars, where the, the Eiffel Tower is now. So the Eiffel Tower would be about here, and has a view on the military school, that large, large school that is behind there. So they would use that very large uh, piece of land that was not built up. Uh, and uh, if anything was built, it would be demolished. And this is in 67, the way it looked. And again, as I said, there will be numerous one. It was an island of um, 119 acres that was built with that uh, building. And in there you had uh, all kinds of things, mostly made in France and uh, uh, some uh, art exhibition, but technical things too. And then other countries could exhibit too. And this is where uh, Manet doesn't like the idea of landscape, but because it has a purpose, then he shows uh, pretty much what happens and what you see in the background there is the, 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 the big exhibition uh, hall. But also, as I mentioned, you have the, all that renewal of Paris is going to open that cafe culture. 
And I think it must struck you when you go to Paris, it's actually the same in, in Brussels. Uh, you have this cafe at every corner of the street and uh, very often now with a terrace where people can, uh, covered or not, but where people can enjoy people going by. They're looking at the passant, you know, at the, the, the couples or the individual just strolling the street. Uh, but it really changed the, the mentality in, in Paris. And even uh, uh, young women of well-to-do family could go by themselves there, take a newspaper and, and read the newspaper with a coffee because coffee had been introduced a century before in Paris and had become by then quite uh, usual. So, uh, it, for the painters, it's going to become quite a subject, too. And so many are going to go sit there and then start sketching things and uh, painting, as it's the case here with Manet and the woman uh, reading. So during the last part of the 19th century, literally, uh, the number of cafes went from in, 19, in 1851 from 4,000 to 42,000 in 1885. So it's incredible the number of cafes. And uh, in France by 1835, they already said 283,000 cafes, coffee houses. Uh, but it's interesting because there, there is different ways of looking at it. The administration didn't care for these cafes because apparently there were some of them where you had revolutionary ideas that were discussed. And so they destroyed a lot of the archives that had to do with this. So you had different class of caf cafes. You had the middle class, you had the lower class, and then the working class. And so these are would be different way you would have, uh, for example, in the working class, they very quickly had counters and people could come and sit at the counter and have a cafe there and the glasses would be washed in front of them, not in the kitchen, uh, which is what the bars do nowadays, if you want. They added uh, mirrors in the back of the, the behind the counters because it opened up and gave people could look better. It was less obscure. So uh, a whole different things. What kind of alcohol uh, beside cafe, beside coffee, uh, they would sell uh, beer and uh, different uh, spirits as well as absinthe. And absinthe was a very dangerous thing because it was extremely strong and people became literally almost addicted to it until it was forbidden in 1914. They forbid uh, absent for quite a while. Uh, it, was, it was called the green, the green fairies. And what was it made of? I don't think. Oh, it's, I'm going to come back uh, at it with the, the recipe for it if you want. It, it's, it's a really, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, a, um, what is it called? And you can add things to it that make it really dangerous for health too. So, but I will uh, talk about that uh, later on. So um, you had also, what is interesting, you had women became uh, owners of cafes and were part of la patronne, you know, the patron was, was important in the, the spirit of the cafe. So uh, it became a place for um, for artists to gather and for other people or, or um, uh, writers or philosophers to sit down and write. Here is a lithograph uh, of Manet at the cafe where he presents a whole series of his friends that are sitting there and discussing. As I mentioned, lesser known of his works are a whole series of lithographs that he did. He really liked the medium. And the cafes could not have existed without the new Paris. Absent, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, really the, the very closely tied to the cafe culture because uh, they were people like uh, Manet, Gauguin, and Degas would frequently drink absent. 
uh, Toulouse Lautrec and uh, Vincent van Gogh were the artists that were most uh, heavily affected by alcoholism, the affinity for uh, van Gogh. And uh, what was called, it was called uh, also green fairy or the green goddess uh, as two of the uh, common, most common nicknames uh, for it. They claim, some claim that it was hallucinogen, but it was not an hallucinogen. It was just extremely strong. It was uh, often served at 80 degrees. So that would be extremely high as uh, twice as strong as any uh, today. So it, that became a real uh, problem. Here is, you can see the greenish color in the glass next to the, the man. You can see the absent drinker. And this is again, one of his work, very influenced by uh, Velasquez in, in spirit. But this is what you see quite often is uh, the, in the different cafes that they used to, to go to. And Manet was very specific. He liked the uh, Cafe Tortoni when he, he lived somewhere, then moved to, uh, to others, the, um, the Cafe Gerbois and so on uh, later on, uh, depending on where he lived. You know, I know, but it, it's actually inspired by oh. the Cafe Tortoni that existed in Paris. Oh. Yeah, it is. So uh, here you can see you would have what is most probably a little adventure of the day where you have that young woman who's smoking, by the way, it's quite interesting, uh, and also has a glass, what seems to be a, a beer uh, next to her, next to a guy who is actually looking at the spectacle. This is a cafe concert. Uh, so you can see in the mirror behind there that there is a woman who is singing uh, and that's what his attention is uh, taken by. But definitely there is a discrep discrepancy in age between these two that make them an illegitimate couple. So all these cafes, this is the Café Tortoni the way it was in, in Paris. And as I said, it was inspiration for the one in Buenos Aires. Uh, but these were became really the place where the artists would go sit down, discuss, discuss what they were going to do, their next exhibition, the next subject, the, the, or just the, the fact they were angry at some official because they didn't accept them. And here you have, for example, the rendezvous des artistes that used to be the brasserie, the Reichshafen, uh, where Manet used to go. And you can see all these paintings that show exactly what Baudelaire wanted. It's the modern life, things that were happening, real people, uh, even if sometimes they were prostitutes because prostitution was rampant at that time. And you can see again, you see there's a spectacle behind. That's the mirror that reflects what is happening in the, in the room. Towards the end of his life, this is one of the last large painting that he did, uh, the bar at the Folie Berger, which was of course criticized a lot. Why? Because his perspective is not correct. What you see to the right of her is her back. That wouldn't be possible. You would never be able to see it. But for him, he wanted to show it that way. It was a voluntary uh, discrepancy with reality, if you want. Uh, but you also see uh, what is here is one of these Polly Berger, so had these large uh, uh, spectacles with uh, acrobats, with all kinds of things. And here you can just see the feet of the trapeze person, trapeze person, uh, who is up above. And then you can see people there, they, they have actually identified some of the people that are up in the, in the boxes. So you, you have here something that is very pleasing to the eye. 
She, she's in your face, she's pretty. Uh, you have a still life on the foreground. Uh, but again, it doesn't respect what was taught at the academy. Paris, as I said, and France in general, knew, have known an incredibly uh, difficult period during the, the, the 1800s. And uh, the, one of the last one is the Paris Commune in 1871, and that is after the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, the uh, Commune seized power and decide that they wanted to do things their way. And so they barricaded Paris, as you can see the barricade there. It was the, the National Guards who started that and uh, decided also they wanted to take down the Colonne Vendôme. And this is the Place Vendôme where you have all the beautiful jewelers in Paris now and the beautiful hotels. And they took it down because it was surmounted by the statue of Napoleon I. And uh, Courbet was part of the group and he had to exile himself because they bankrupted him. They wanted him to pay for that demolition. And so he, uh, Courbet had to leave and finished his life in Switzerland. And so when Manet avoided that uh, conflict, but when he came back, he was still able to see the, the results of that uh, terrible a period that literally killed th hundred thousands of people. But as everything, life goes by. And so he is, as well as uh, Monet will a uh, few years, no, yeah, this is painted the same year. It's really interesting to see the difference between Monet on the right and Manet on the left, where Monet is only looking at the joy of people. It's a, a, a beautiful day, it's a fete, the feast of peace, celebration of peace. Um, and Monet looks at the joy of people, whereas Manet looks at it, but he also looks at the people that are on the street. And you have well-to-do people with a carriage, well-dressed, but you have somebody there who has lost a leg and who is walking with scratches that obviously has been to war. And this is the result of it. But Manet was, as I mentioned, a very diverse painter. And so we see all kinds of things uh, with him. I'm just gonna go through a few of them. This is Victorine Meurant again, shown with the daughter of a friend of Manet whose uh, garden was used for this painting. And they are backing up on the Gare Saint-Lazare. So there is that kind of uh, aspect where he doesn't show the, the locomotive but he's showing the steam that comes out, which is a, a sign of modernity. He went to Venice with Baudelaire, and uh, this is one of the very few landscapes that you can see by Manet. And there you can definitely see the influence of the Impressionist in the kind of light that he reflects. He's gonna do some portrait. This is a much more um, conservative, traditional type of portrait of two friends of his. And just for the story, it was, it is though, uh, it wasn't stolen, but it was put for protection in the salt mine, the Merkur salt mine, where the American soldiers found it and returned it to the, the the museum in Berlin. And this is a far more traditional way of painting. So you see some of the painters can really revert to, to things that are much more traditional. Or oh, this one, but have Mrs. Uh, Berlin. This is a uh, pastel because by that time he was really not well and painting with oil was hard on him. So he did that one with pastel, which was much easier. Towards the end of his life, he's going to do also some still lives and that uh, some of the few still lives that he did uh, about three years before he died. And these are also pastel. 
So in April 83, his left foot was amputated because of gangrene and he died 11 days later. Um, he had the long, uh, not a very long career, but a decent career. He, he was by that time really loved by people. He had been criticized a lot, but made a lot of friends too, and really became seen as what he refused to be the, the father of Impressionism, which he totally refused, but he knew that he had a, quite an influence on the Impressionists. That actually influenced him too, towards the end of his career. He was a pioneer, just like Kobe. So we'll look at the next great movement, which is Impressionism. We'll see it in three different phases, Impressionism in nature, uh, leisure, what is it, Impressionism and leisure, and then, um, is it's the third one that I'm escaping from right now, but we have it on the, the schedule. So February 11, I hope to see you. That's going to be, and I decide not to give you uh, biographies, but rather group it by the kind of paintings they were doing. And so we will see the young women that we talked about, Eva Gonzalez and uh, Beth Morisot and so on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. My pleasure.